right, how's everybody doing out there? Still alive, love it. All right, well next up we have two sessions left for you and we are going to be talking about Pendo for Enterprise Sales and Customer Success. And I have to tell you as a CSM, this is one I am particularly excited for. So please help me welcome James Meehan from Director of Product Operations at Kentech. Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Meehan and I head up product operations at Kentic. Uh, I hand, hail from the Lake Tahoe area on the California-Nevada border. And uh, on Monday we had snow and lows in the 20s, so I'm very grateful to be here in Raleigh this afternoon at an outdoor live event, uh, one more day of summer. So and I hope all, all of you are having a good time as well. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, using Pendo for enterprise sales and customer success uh, at Kentic, uh, which is maybe a little bit different than, uh, well, at least I thought it was a little bit different than how a lot of people were using Kentic, but I am happy to hear some other stories uh, about um, using, uh, oh, I'm seeing some uh, faces in the crowd like my audio may not be working. Well, good, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I was happy to hear some other stories uh, about people using, Pentic, uh, using Pendo for uh, the sales process and, and post-sales process. So um, oh, there's my name slide. Uh, from an agenda standpoint, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kentic and uh, product operations, just to give you a little context about where we're coming from, and then spend a little time about what is enterprise sales. And then we'll move on to talking about context and data enrichment to make the data inside Pendo relevant for teams outside of product teams. And uh, then what they get out of Pendo, uh, how they access the data, and then we'll talk about a case study at the end. So who is Kentic? Uh, Kentic is a platform for observability of network infrastructure. And observability might be sort of an unfamiliar term in this crowd, but in the um, IT operations and kind of uh, SRE crowd, uh, observability is sort of a buzzword these days. And to me, it means the ability to answer the questions that you didn't know you were going to have. Uh, we, in a lot of domains, still operate in a from a perspective that compute and storage are really expensive and scarce, and it's not the case anymore. So um, I don't see Pendo's marketing team using the observability term, but it really applies to Pendo as well, and it's kind of a shared differentiator for both Kentic and Pendo in the sense that we both keep all of the data and I can tag new things or ask new questions, and all of the old data gets reprocessed so that I can answer questions that I didn't anticipate. And that's as opposed to past solutions that might have a monitoring or logging uh, category associated with them, where you really had to think in advance about what data was gonna be important later. Uh, so to this crowd, I can describe Kentic as uh, if your product is the network itself, then Kentic is kind of your pendo. Our customers are big ISPs, telecoms, other companies who run network infrastructure to deliver a product or service, and they use Kentic for uh, both product-focused needs to understand how their customers are using the network and how they need to respond to customer demands on the network, and also for real-time troubleshooting. So if the network is down, uh, why is that happening? What are we gonna do about it? Those sorts of things. We operate uh, our platform as a multi-tenant SaaS platform. We do have a couple of private SaaS, like single tenant deployments that we operate as if they were one of our multi-tenant platforms. Uh, so uh, we still have remote access to those. Uh, we're uh, coming up on seven years old. We're about 150 people now. About a third of our organization is on the revenue side. So uh, sales, customer success, SEs, that sort of thing. Um, I went on our hiring website to find a picture of the company from an offsite a couple years ago, and I found that it had been replaced by a uh, Zoom Hollywood Squares uh, image, um, which I guess is the, the reality that we've all been living in the last 18 months. Uh, a couple of um, you know, comments from our customers about how they use Kentic. Uh, the graph in the top left there is a traffic graph from Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. And so if you're, if you're not familiar, Microsoft tends to release 
Windows updates on Tuesdays. And of course, the, all of the Windows machines in the world downloading all that stuff at the same time creates a huge spike of traffic. So a customer of ours who is, let's say, a uh, cable modem, uh, you know, a cable company or a telco, uh, they need to know uh, where is that traffic coming from? Microsoft uses a variety of content delivery networks to deliver those updates. Um, has Microsoft made any changes in the mix of CDNs they're using to deliver those updates? Do I have enough network capacity with the sources of traffic for those updates so I can make sure that there isn't going to be network congestion? Um, if uh, the timing had lined up a little bit differently, I would have put a, a traffic graph on here from Facebook's outage last Monday because you can see about a six hour chasm in the volume of traffic while that outage was going on. And that's really a case study in why and how networks have become so fundamental to businesses because if you don't know the backstory on the Facebook outage, um, you might think it was just like a botched software deploy or whatever, but what actually happened is they pushed a bad configuration change to the routers that connect Facebook's infrastructure to the rest of the internet. And the, um, the internet routing table dropped all of Facebook's routes so that it was, you know, all of their infrastructure was unreachable. And it made it so that they couldn't simply roll back the change. The, uh, um, the routers became inaccessible remotely. The key card readers could not reach the uh, authentication server, so they couldn't get into the data center to physically access the routers. They couldn't even access the messaging system that they would normally use to contact the data center facilities managers to show up with the old brass key to open the door. Uh, so, um, you know, the networks are really pervasive and, and it kind of speaks to why uh, good tooling is really essential these days for people who operate networks. Uh, we first deployed Pendo at Kentic at the beginning of 2020. Um, before that, we had no real product analytics. Um, we had someone who had built uh, an adoption score, if you will, looking at how people were using uh, different parts of our product as kind of a daily report. Uh, but uh, obviously, um, we needed something more, and Pendo has really become a critical tool for product management. Uh, to, to decide what to build and how it's being adopted. But I think what surprised me after we deployed it is how widely Pendo became adopted across other, uh, other, other departments in our organization. Uh, the table that you see on the right is uh, a, um, like a usage report. Um, and this isn't something that's built into Pendo, but if you email Pendo's customer success team, they will happily send you a report of uh, all the users that are logging into your Pendo instance and uh, their days active and number of events and time used. Uh, and the color code here, so the green rows are uh, our product team, which is a little bigger now than uh, from when this report was run back in uh, March and April. Uh, the, um, I can't see the colors as well here, so I don't remember what I put. I think um, the light blue roll rows are our customer success team, and the pink rows are sales and SEs. And if you notice, the very top row there actually beat out me, uh, who is you know, kind of our pedo, pendo administrator in terms of days active, and that person is our uh, director of sales for North America. So he's in Pendo Daily looking at how trial customers are using our product um, are there uh, people accessing the product that they didn't know about as potential stakeholders for a deal? Uh, a bunch of other questions. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. The, um, we also export data from Pendo into a data warehouse. And so it drives a lot of internal BI dashboards uh, that are mixed with other data outside of Pendo. We also make a good use of the guides functionality for product tours and, and other things like that. I also wanted to spend a minute on product operations as a discipline because it's sort of a emerging field and it looks a little bit different at uh, different types of companies. Uh, in my role, I'm responsible for analytics and tooling, so of course Pendo but also Salesforce to a certain degree because we use Salesforce to manage feature requests and to rank and prioritize them. Uh, we have a BigQuery data warehouse instance that consumes data from Pendo and Salesforce and other places. 
Uh, and I also deal with the integrations between those. I act as a liaison to our engineering teams, to our uh, product marketing and sales teams. Of course, individual PMs have relationships with those teams as well, but I end up dealing with a lot of broader issues um, that are not related to individual product areas. Uh, processes, of course, so um, one of the big processes I deal with is uh, what we call ICE, um, and that's our um, prioritization and, and ranking process, which stands for impact, confidence, and ease, and that's how we score the things in our backlog and the things that we are working on from a strategic uh, standpoint to decide um, what's going to go on the roadmap for the quarters ahead. Um, and then, um, you know, individual PMs have uh, rankings with, within their own areas of the product, but I also deal with um, sort of, you know, how much allocation is each product area going to get um, on the roadmap for the upcoming quarters. And then I deal with content too, so things like um, providing team updates to the rest of the company, release notes. Uh, I build a lot of the guides for our um, in-product uh, tours. The individual PMs provide the content, but I'm sort of the, the implementer for those. Um, so what is enterprise sales? Um, so these are some of the things I think about um, when I think about enterprise sales as differentiated from um, other sales models or sales uh, methodologies, right? If you have a complex product or your product deals with a complex product space and you have an in-depth trial and evaluation process, so it's not something that someone is going to make a call on over the course of a day or even 30 days. Um, if you've ever read uh, Mark Suster's blog, he's a VC who has a great blog series on startup lessons, if you will. Um, one of his blog posts, which is probably 10 years old now, um, talks about, you know, are you hunting rabbits, deer, or elephants? Um, and so I think of enterprise sales as being toward the elephant side of that scale, right? Um, you know, these are, these are long sales cycles. Um, the ASP is high enough that there's going to be uh, a lot of stakeholders and approvers within the organization. Uh, and uh, it's the kind of sales process where personal relationships still matter a lot uh, because, uh, you know, the people who are making this decision, their uh, reputation is going to be on the line because it has a lot of visibility. They want to have relationships with people in your organization uh, and feel comfortable that you've got their back if things go sideways um, after the sale. And so some of you might be asking, uh, Hey, isn't that kind of old school? Um, you know, isn't everything moving toward a product-led growth model? And I think there is a, um, in some product-led circles, there is a, a, a message, either implicit or explicit, that every organization should move to uh, try before you buy, free tier, sign up with a credit card, um, self-service sales model. And um, I say, hold up, um, not every product is going to be sold that way. Um, let's say that uh, I've built a SaaS platform that is going to revolutionize aircraft maintenance scheduling and uh, logistics, right? I'm probably not going to sell that successfully by saying, hey, we'll give you your first three planes for free, and you can put your credit card for the next five planes. And it's not going to be the mechanic or even the maintenance uh, advisor at a given station that's going to be you know, investigating this product, right? Um, I can really only know if this product is going to be successful for me. Um, and it's only going to work for me if I adopt it on an organization-wide basis. And that's because... Um, the really hairy problems of aircraft maintenance and, and scheduling and logistics only show up when you're dealing with hundreds of planes and hundreds of mechanics and hundreds of destinations. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a whole universe of big, hairy enterprise problems that software has not really revolutionized yet. I think we're just at the tip of that iceberg. And so if you've ever read... Peter Thiel's book, One to Zero, um, he talks about um, the concept of secrets, which is uh, you know, like a truth that you know that few other people in your, uh, that few other people know, right? Um, 
And so the reason that we don't see more uh, companies focusing on enterprise sales models and um, these big, hairy enterprise problems is because there's this little teeny intersection on that Venn diagram there, right? If I'm a uh, recent college grad, I'm probably not going to be the founder of that aircraft maintenance platform because I don't have the experience in that industry to know what the problem space is. And on the flip side, if I've spent 30 years working my way up from mechanic to VP of maintenance at Southwest Airlines, I'm probably not going to be the founder of a software startup because I don't have the risk tolerance for that, um, you know, I've got a, maybe a family and a mortgage and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for founders here and, and enterprise sales is still gonna be really relevant as software moves in to start to solve some of those problems. Uh, I could spend a whole talk just on that topic at a different conference, but let's move on to uh, how uh, you can use Pendo if you do have an enterprise sales model or, or uh, you know, are thinking about an organization that does. Uh, so uh, this is something, uh, a concept that I um, heard from someone I was interviewing recently for uh, a position at Kentic, and it's the concept of being both shopkeeper and chef. Uh, if you wanna give access to uh, other organizations to product usage data, you wanna make uh, things available that they can use in a self-service manner, like uh, sort of components, um, and so in Pendo, that might be things like segments, uh, you know, data, um, context, but also chef. So you're producing like some pre-canned output, some reports, some things that they can consume uh, out of the box. Um, it's all about making the data relevant. So I heard a previous presenter talking about this as well. Um, if they come into Pendo and they can't see the labels that make sense to them, like, you know, let's say I'm an account rep, I probably want to see all of the um, uh, accounts that belong to me. Um, I, I need that context to, to make it useful for me. Uh, so some of that is in uh, your product metadata, right? Uh, things that you want to pull in from your product to uh, contextualize Pendo data. And so this comes with uh, you know, the agent install and the things that you pass to Pendo on the Pendo initialize call. Uh, things like uh, you know, labels and tags that are relevant within your product. Um, it could be consumption data. So in our product, we have the concept of the volume of data that we receive from people's networks. That's not something I'm gonna get out of Pendo directly. Uh, so I need to add that in from the product data. Um, I guess uh, a thing that is, was key for us that we didn't realize until after the fact, we avoided putting usernames and email addresses in Dependo because of um, GDPR concerns, and it became impossible for people to understand who was who if they had to go look up a user token somewhere else. Um, so we got over that hump and we put names and email addresses in Dependo now. Um, get all of this added up front. Um, it's frustrating for the developers that maintain your pendo.js um, if you keep coming back to them over and over again saying, hey, can you add this, can you add this, can you add this? Uh, Salesforce integration or whatever CRM you're using, this is a no-brainer. Um, you need to have in there things like <clears throat> sales regions, account rep and SE assignments, um, revenue and ARR that are associated, um, customer vertical and sub-vertical. Um, Pendo's Salesforce integration is really strong. Um, and then pre-create segments and reports based on that stuff so it makes it easy for um, sales and CS to consume. And so these are some of the things that we um, import from Salesforce to map to um, account and, and user assignments uh, inside Pendo. Um, and these are some of the segments that uh, have been created on the basis of that Salesforce data. So now, when an uh, account rep or an SE comes into Pendo, they can choose a segment that's uh, based on their sales, story, sales territory and see just the accounts that are assigned to them. Um, output, so how do, uh, how do these other teams that are not product teams access the Pendo data? Um, a key one is just ad hoc investigation, right? They have a question in the moment. Um, they don't wanna have to come email me or ask someone else, um, you know, 
how often does uh, account X, Y, or Z log in, right? Um, what parts of the product are they using? They can self-service answer those questions now by coming into Pendo. Uh, and um, you know, with a little bit of training on Pendo's UI, it's pretty straightforward for them to um, uh, make use of this. And, and you can see that in you know, my, uh, my usage report that I presented up front, um, that our sales folks uh, are using this a lot. Um, reports. So um, there's a, a lot of great functionality inside Pendo for pre-canned reports that people can access. So going one step beyond creating um, segments, you could create usage reports for specific product areas that gives sales and CS visibility into how their accounts are using certain parts of the product. Um, how often do they use it? How long? Uh, those sorts of things. Um, then uh, there's also a Salesforce push capability. So I can s configure Pendo to take those metrics, um, like let's say we've launched a new product area, and we want to have in Salesforce some fields that represent uh, accounts that are using the new product area regularly so that we can easily target them for upsells. I can create a report in Pendo and then um, configure a Salesforce push to take the per row metrics like days active on this product area or uh, total minutes used and push it back into a Salesforce field. Then when uh, customer success or sales are looking uh, for accounts to reach out to about upsells, they can just run that report right in Salesforce based on the Pendo metrics that have been pushed back into the Salesforce field. So this is something that happens nightly uh, based on a report that you uh, set up in Pendo. Um, another output is our uh, BI stack. So um, this is not a comprehensive uh, view of our BI stack at Kentic, but it has some of the major components. So we use BigQuery as our data warehouse. We have Kentic product data feeding into BigQuery directly. And then we use uh, um, an ETL, a cloud-based ETL product called Fivetran, which can pull data out of a variety of other products' APIs and push it into our, uh, our BigQuery data warehouse. Uh, and uh, we settled on Fivetran because, uh, I don't know if this is still true, but they were the only ones at the time who had integrated with Pendo's API. Uh, so the upshot is that all of the detailed history data about clicks and page visits and visitors and accounts that's in Pendo, we have access to to mix and match and combine with data from these other sources in BigQuery. And then we output that to Looker for dashboards and kind of ad hoc analysis, and to Catalyst, which is the platform that our customer success team uses for uh, account health. Uh, and so Catalyst will flag for customer success accounts that are at risk of non-renewal because they haven't logged in, or because their usage is dropped, or a variety of other reasons. Uh, so, um, there's a lot you could do by integrating Pendo's data in a, in a BI stack. Um, this is a little bit about, uh, a little bit more detail about Catalyst. Um, it, uh, it combines the product usage data, the NPS scores, uh, the uh, contract renewal dates, um, you know, kind of comprehensive customer information. Um, these are generic screenshots that I grabbed from uh, Catalyst's website, but they kind of give you a flavor for the sort of things that Catalyst presents to our customer success team. Uh, and then uh, it can automatically alert them about things like accounts that are at uh, risk of churn or even upsell opportunities. Uh, so uh, customers that are using parts of the product that they don't have licensed or um, they're getting close to using up their their free usage allocation. Um, I heard someone else talk about this during the forum this morning, which is uh, the real-time NPS score integration for Slack. So we have a Slack channel uh, called uh, PM-NPS, but there's a lot more people than PM in it. Every time someone responds to the NPS survey in the product, we get their response as a message in that Slack channel. Um, and so it includes their score but in any uh, comments that they've left. Uh, and our CS team uses this to reach out to customers 
whether, regardless of whether their score is good or bad. Um, so um, people that leave good scores, we reach out to as potential advocates. People that leave bad scores, we reach out to to see, hey, how can we help? You know, how can we make this better for you? Uh, and you know, frustratingly, the response rate to our CS teams outreach is kind of low, even after you know, like repeated follow-ups. Um, some people, I think, um, you know, if they've left a bad score, it's because um, you know, their, their engagement is low, right? And so not um, prone to engaging further uh, even with outreach. But sometimes we uncover issues that they haven't proactively brought to our CS team's attention and we can resolve it for them. And you know, then the next time their score goes from a four to a 10. So that's great as well. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about here is a, a case study um, where uh, Pendo was really effective for uh, bringing uh, you know, the, the ARR from a specific customer up by a lot. Um, we had a customer, um, they were uh, um, on a subscription for 180K ARR with a renewal due at the end of this uh, November. Um, and uh, the champion within that customer reached out to our CS team about adding some additional capacity. Um, and we suggested that we pull forward their renewal to be aligned with the uh, um, new um, capacity that they wanted to add. We, we try to uh, co-term any upgrades so that we're not dealing with multiple um, contracts that have different expiration dates at the same customer. And so, um, the proposal was uh, an upsell that resulted in 90K of new ARR for us and moving them from uh, a 12-month uh, contract to a 24-month contract for a larger discount. And we got uh, pushback from their procurement team about, um, you know, well, hey, I know about these other competing products at a much lower cost. Um, you know, have you considered going that route instead of increasing the spend uh, with Kentic. Um, and they um, were using that as leverage to insist upon a much deeper discount on what was already a pretty sweet deal. Um, so what our CS team did was they looked in, in Pendo at this customer's usage statistics to justify, hey, you know what? This is a product that your team uses. A lot of people in your organization use it. A lot of people in your organization use it every day. It's really valuable to your organization. Um, and so the, you know, some of those statistics were um, over the last six months, um, there were 177 out of uh, 190 active days, right? The, um, the customer used the product almost every day. Uh, more than 90 uni unique users. Uh, even when we looked at short time ranges, like the last seven days, um, there were still 30 unique users um, logged into our product. Uh, and so this was information that was really critical to pushing back against the procurement team and landing that upsell and, and renewal. Uh, and uh, there's you know n number of other examples like this. Uh, across uh, um, Kentix uh, sales and, and CS organizations. So um, I guess uh, to sum up, um, you know, there's lots of lessons in product-led for every organization, um, but not every organization is going to be able to move to a product-led growth model. Um, enterprise sales is still relevant and, and maybe increasingly relevant as um, big business solves more problems with software. Uh, context is really key to making Pendo data useful for other teams in your organization. Um, so take advantage of built-in integrations, take advantage of um, adding external data um, onto your Pendo data using the integrations that are, that are built into Pendo. Um, you wanna provide curated data, um, curated output to make it easy, but you also wanna allow for self-service. So um, some training, uh, some, uh, you know, providing uh, details on how other organizations uh, in your company can make use of Pendo. Um, that's really key um, to making sure that Pendo's value to the organization goes way beyond uh, just product teams. So thanks everyone for uh, uh, coming to listen to my talk. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and uh, all the festivities this evening.